Hello, and welcome to the Bob Reeves Brass live Facebook stream. I'm so honored to have today's guest, second trumpet with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and founder of Honesty Pill, Christopher Still. Let's bring Christopher in. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, John, good can to see you. you hear me well, okay? I can see and hear you perfectly. It's uh, another win for technology. Nice job. Oh, uh, well, and I, you know, I have to say before we get started, I owe all of this to you. Um, you know, the my my pandemic quarantine safe at home experience would have been totally different because I was sitting at home panicked and I was on Facebook and was on your Honesty Pill Facebook group. And I think your post was something like, you know, just find something to do today, choose one thing and do it. I mean, very simple, actionable advice. And I was like, well, okay, by gosh, I'll do it. And I started doing podcasts, more cranking podcasts out. And then I did the second one with you. And you told me, get into video, <laughs> do video, just jump in. And here we are. So I owe all of that to you and all of the great advice and inspiration you're providing. <laughs> oh, so it's it's all my fault. I take full responsibility for that. <laughs> no, but um, your podcast and, you know, thanks for having me again, by the way. It's mm. such a pleasure. And um, the depth of knowledge for anybody who hasn't listened to all of those podcasts that you have on the other side of the bell is, is mind blowing. And also, I would just want to say the range of the types of information and players that you've had on there um, from you know, orchestral players, commercial players, teachers, uh, people who are creating new things. It's it's quite a resource, and I'm um, I'm honored to be part of it in some way. So thank you for that. Oh, my my pleasure, my pleasure. So let's get to the questions. And for those of you watching, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. Of course, that's half the fun of doing these things is being able to connect with people from around the world. Uh, so show us some love in the comments. Show us where you're viewing from, and most importantly, we have Chris still here for the next half hour, 45 minutes, so ask away. Um, a couple of these questions came in in advance from uh, Instagram. So the first one was on uh, audition prep, uh, and it was um, high school students getting ready to audition for college. Uh, so what's your uh, advice for sounding your best for college preparation, uh, college auditions? Yeah, um, start earlier than you think in your preparation because that deadline will be here before you know it. Um, although I had a, that's an interesting question about preparing for college auditions and how that's different than a professional audition. And normally uh, there's going to be such a variance in the repertoire you're asked for. It's, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what you have to prepare for your particular college audition, but if it's um, excerpts, I think the process would be very similar where just having a good idea in your head of what you want it to sound like mm -hmm. before you even bring the horn up to your face. And that, that includes tempos where you're going to breathe, the style, the articulation, the equipment, um, the level of intensity or character of the sound, all that stuff has to be worked out before you even pick up your horn. Otherwise, you're going to have to undo something. Um, the other part of it is to have an actual musical character in mind. And this, this goes for etudes or if it's an excerpt from a piece of music that your college band might be doing. is just isolate one part of it and then assign it a single keyword. And I like to think of this in terms of um, characters like toy soldier or foreboding or uh, words that really conjure something other than like real specific uh, generic things like nice or loud or strong. Um, I've actually used a website called thesaurus.com where I've put my keyword in and then it'll bring up a little map of words that are in the same orbit and I can start to hone in on does that word take me closer to my character or further away. And I mean, if you can bring all those nuts and bolts and combine it with the musical character together, that's that's what wins uh, auditions and jobs. That's what gets you the higher placement chair in college. Um, and you can even test this out with friends. I know, John, I think you and I maybe have talked about this. Um, I like to do something called the 10 word test where you write down your keyword along with nine other adjectives and give it to a piece, give a piece of paper to someone and say, hey, I'm going to play a piece of music for you right now. Can you circle the word that it makes you think of? And if you get them to circle your keyword, that's a slam dunk right there. Fascinating. Great advice. Wow. <laughs> makes me want to go back to college. Wow. <laughs> it, I tell you, it's, it's yeah. not easy. And you can make that 10-word test as hard on yourself as you want by the other words you're using. But I, I find that most people are not thinking in terms of musical character when they're at an audition. Um, it, it's sort of like transposing, right? When you transpose something, what are you actually focusing on? Mm -hmm. You're literally focusing on what button to press down, like what is that actual note? 
that is the furthest removed uh, technique that I can think of from actually making music. If you can transcend your approach to something like transposition practice to include, uh, clearly you have to play the right notes, right? But to include the musical character with it, that's a really good um, mental challenge for presenting at an audition as well. So just be aware of what you're actually putting out there when you're at an audition. It shouldn't be all about the nuts and the bolts. It shouldn't be all about the articulation and the intonation and the sound. Clearly those things have to be included, but you really need to make a musical connection to to win a job or, yeah. or an audition. And that would carry over to a professional audition in like orchestra, things like that, similar advice. Oh, same, I mean, the, the same mistakes that uh, high school players are making when they're entering college, uh, we carry those habits with us when we get out into the freelance world or on the audition circuit. Nothing, nothing magical happens. Nothing changes until you decide to change it. So whatever bad habits you have today, right now, you'll still have those in 30 years unless you do something about it. <laughs> Sorry to say. Right, right. Uh, man, I mean, this is amazing. We already have basically the whole world checking in. we got Matt Collins from Sydney, Australia. We have Mark from Switzerland. We have Santa Fe, New Mexico, the UK, Nor Norfolk, Virginia. So greetings from everyone who's viewing. Uh, of course, if you have any questions for Chris, uh, let us know. Um, I have a few others from Instagram we'll get to, but I want to uh, make the viewers happy. Uh, Mark was asking uh, about your mouth piece choice. Can you speak a little bit to what you use? Uh, what would yes. be a trumpet trumpet Q&A without equipment talk, right? <laughs> Got to talk about the equipment. Um, I'm going to answer the question in a, in a roundabout way before I actually just tell you the answer you're, you're asking, because it just is such a strange question. And trumpet players, uh, I work with a lot of different types of musicians with my coaching, audition prep and practice prep. And trumpet players specifically, we're so equipment focused. We're just so worried about it so much. And the reality is, um, you know, they're, it's like running shoes, or I'm a runner. Um, you go to a marathon, you're going to see a lot of different uh, gates, a lot of different feet shapes, a lot of different body mechanic structures that work in different ways, and loads of different run running shoes made by different companies out of different material. Some people have shoes that are really torsionally rigid, some of them are really uh, light and floaty. Um, some, you know, you spend all this time worrying about which running shoe you're going to wear for the marathon, and then the elite runner from Nigeria wins the thing without any shoes on at all, right? So it's it's not always about the equipment. It's about what you're doing with it and how you're approaching it. Having said that, I think that some equipment will suit you better than others, and it's worth exploring to a certain degree. But, I mean, in, I don't even really need to say this, what I'm about to say, but you you can go down a rabbit hole and never come out and constantly be blaming the equipment. And I, you know... It's, it's actually a good question, what mouthpiece do I play? Because I spent decades sort of messing around and trying to find that secret mouthpiece and ignoring the fact that I had a really inefficient aperture and that no mouthpiece in the world was going to fix that, was going to hold everything in just the right space. In fact, if something is really out of balance, then the, the mouthpiece choice is probably going to be hitting a wall at some other part of your playing. Like... Uh, dynamic range or uh, endurance or your actual range, how high, how low can you play? So before you even get into this question, you have to understand how your mechanics work. And and again, it's a balance of not spending so much time worrying about this, that, the other, and spending just enough time that you're aware of it. So having said that, I basically play on a Bach one and a quarter. Um, I can't remember what the throat is. Um, and so that evolved into the mouthpiece I've played for the past many, 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 many years. Until recently, um, so I, I'm in the LA Phil, my colleagues, we all try and match each other the best we can. Uh, I'm also the second trumpet player in that orchestra, so a really critical part of my job is matching my principal, Tom Hooten, I'm sure you all know. And he recently had a mouthpiece designed for him by Yamaha that is, I think it's pretty close to a one and a quarter, I don't know. Um, he brought one in for me to try it, and I, I gotta say, at this point in my career, I don't think what mouthpiece I'm playing is so critical as far as my ability to play, mm -hmm. but the quality of the sound, having it match my colleagues is actually more important to me. So it's definitely a granular uh, level of, of attention that I give the equipment. Having said that, that mouthpiece matching the horn that I'm playing, matching my principal, 
it was a really good synergy. So that's what I'm playing on right now. But it's it's basically a one and a quarter. I I couldn't even tell you what the number is on on the Yamaha because it's a different numbering system. But that's the ballpark. Basically, great answer, great answer. And so that actually brings up a follow up question from me about uh, I mean the role of equipment in matching because I mean there's some sections, uh, orchestra sections that all use the same model and the same mouthpiece or si similar mouthpieces. Uh, some orchestras where players show up and play whatever they want. Um, so how, is, how important is that for you guys in LA? It's really important. Um, and there's another element too also, which is matching the hall that you play in and the tendencies of the acoustics of that environment. Um, so we've found in Walt Disney Concert Hall that the Yamaha uh, Generation 3 Chicago C trumpet is a really nice fit for the, the timbre of that space. And, um, you know, the hall is so interesting that when there's there's treble instruments playing, like one bass drum can knock all that out, especially w w as far as hitting the mics. It's just the way the acoustics work. So we've found that if we skew a little bit brighter in that uh, that spectrum of sound, I think it carries better when something big is happening, like Strauss or Mahler or something. Um, but matching within um, the section is really critical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's each of us is a different player, and we all come from it from different uh, backgrounds and different concepts. But the job is to create a composite sound, especially as a section player, mm -hmm. where I need to match what Tom or Jim or whoever I'm matching uh, is doing um, 100%. So uh, but before you came to L.A., you, you played principal. Do you think that helped being in that role to then become a supporting player? Well, absolutely. And that's a great question, John, because I've, a lot of times I'll ask people, uh, so what's your dream job? You know, And they're like, you have my dream job. I want to be a second trumpet player. I'm like, all right, cool. Why, why did you answer the question that way? And the answer is sometimes, well... I don't really have a really good high range and I don't like to lead and I get nervous when I play solos and you know that's kind of why I want a section job and I laugh because that may be true if you're only playing Haydn symphonies all day long and you're just you know maybe I don't even know if that's true uh, section trumpet playing especially with the way composers like Andrew Norman and Esa Pekka Salonen and, and, and Thomas Addis are writing John Adams the section players are playing right up there with the principal players a lot of the time and they're acting as individual voices. So, I mean, just think about it. When was the last time you saw an excerpt book filled with second trumpet excerpts? Or, or walked past the practice room and heard someone practicing the second trumpet part to Petrushka? Yeah. That is. And not ever, often. Ever. I mean, yeah. rarely ever, yeah. yeah. Um, so the thing is, the skill set is very different. However, the requirements of the job are, are often very similar. And, you know, it's also, I, I can't really speak to what goes inside the heads of my principal, but, um, and my principals, John, uh, Jim and Tom. Mm -hmm. But when I was playing principal in Colorado or in Dallas or Charleston, it, it was nice to know that my second player was like right there with me, feeling confident, feeling ready to jump when I go, when I jump. And that, that's something I try and bring to my job. Uh, I hope that's true. Tom, if you're listening, you can let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if he comments later. <laughs> this could go real viral real quick. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, <laughs> the, end, the end of my career happened right here. <laughs> Live. Uh, man, we got people checking in all over the place. Uh, East Coast, Ben Strickland, our good buddy over at East Coast Trumpet, Steve Hyde from New Jersey. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for viewing. Uh, you know, being on this side of it, it means a lot to know that we're connecting with people from around the world. And, of course, we are here live with Christopher Still. Um, great questions coming in. Uh, Jim is asking uh, about uh, your practicing now uh, away from the concert hall. Do you have any advice to avoid cabin fever and avoiding going down the rabbit hole, please? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, especially when this pandemic first hit and the concert series were canceled, the chamber stuff was canceled, the freelance stuff was canceled, everything just got canceled. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I found myself facing this void where I had, I mean, I have two kids here, we were homeschooling, so that didn't, that was a thing. But um, I found that I had this, this wide canvas all the time in the world to practice, and I found it more difficult than managing my practice schedule when I'm holding down my LA Phil job, which is sort of interesting. Um, what I found was there are basically two types of players, I think. The players who need motivation to 
to practice to, to get up to a level and the players who need to calm down and put some boundaries in their practice and become more efficient so they don't spin their wheels. I am definitely this guy. I'm definitely like energy, energy, energy. Let's do everything. Let's do it all. Let's all do it all right now. What, so what I found was helpful for both of those groups um, was using practice timers um, so that if I felt like I didn't want to practice a certain technique, I would stick with it for the whole time and not get distracted. Or if it was something that I was really enjoying or was really grooving with, that would also cap my, my session on that so I wouldn't spend the whole session on just that thing. Um, so I think that's a really good tool, but higher level than just using a practice timer is having a particular goal for your practice session because that's the easiest way to know how long to practice something. Did you achieve the goal? And you know I've talked about this a lot. If you don't have a goal, then what are you doing in the practice room? Like what, if you're a carpenter and you go out to the shop and you don't have a blueprint or a plan or, or a project to work on, what are you doing out there? Are you just hammering nails into a board? I mean, that's literally what a lot of people's practice sessions look like and sound like too. Uh, yeah, I've, you've, heard, you've heard me practice, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that's probably what I would, what I would do. Um, on the other hand, if you know, like, like I do, um, you know, New York Philharmonic just canceled their fall. The Met has already canceled their fall. I think Nashville is the first orchestra to cancel their entire season, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm pretty sure LA Phil will be falling step behind some of those orchestras at some point. So now is a really interesting time to maybe do some experimenting and get that mouthpiece visualizer out and, you know, experiment with your lower lip efficiency or your tongue placement or something. I mean, it's probably never been a better time to, to take some chances and do some self anal analysis uh, than now. Um, you could also do something like my colleagues are doing in the orchestra where like Jim Wilkes been posting these beautiful videos of, of etudes every week. Um, that's a kind of a fun project or you could do 100 days of practice. Um, I guess the overall point for me, not that, that I've solved all of this, but is just have a, have a point, have a goal to your practice and then have some tools in, in, in line that can keep you from underworking or overworking. And for me, those are uh, practice timers and practice charts. Yeah, great advice. Great advice. Uh, we got a follow up with that. Uh, you're talking about, you know, your uh, aperture being inefficient, things like that. I think that was back with the uh, mouthpiece, but then you also just brought that up, things you can fix. Uh, this question comes from Sanshiro uh, Ogawa. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, how did you discover that your aperture was inefficient? And then what specifically was wrong with it? And what did you do to fix it? <laughs> so there, how you can write we, a book, right? <laughs> how long do we have? Um, bottom line is, and I think it's a pretty common problem for trumpet players, is that the aperture, again, this is a very gen general question, general response to this question. Your mileage may, may vary. Um, I found, though, in my teaching and also my own practice, that a lot of apertures are, are too wide, and they're pinned in that position with the rim of the mouthpiece. And then it requires a lot more force to get the vibration started. Whereas if you think about, you know, uh, plucking a string on a violin or, or drawing the bow across, it, it shouldn't be that hard to create a sound. Although, you know, if you're playing like the UNESCO legend or uh, second trumpet on Schumann II, for example, what is your biggest concern? It's getting the, the note to start perfectly. And for me, I couldn't do that. Or at least I couldn't do it under pressure and I couldn't do it in an audition and I couldn't do it um, with the level of control that I felt like someone who deserved to be paid should be doing it. So. This, I mean, this was years and years and years ago I started to figure this out. Um, so I did start doing some visualizer work and just some concept work. And I think that's where I first discovered the Schubrecht books and just working on slow, soft, low, gentle, low, man, uh, low manipulation poo attacks. And that was game changing for my playing. And I realized just how open it was. Um, another thing you can do if you want a super cheap tool is just go get one of those coffee stirrers, um, you know, those little straws. I don't know. A lot of places are doing away with them now for the environment, which is great. But And just slide it into your mouthpiece. And that that's a pretty good d designator of about how big your aperture should be. Um, no bigger than that, probably. Hmm. Um, this is a can of worms, because I know if you talk to players, they talk about it opening and closing as you go higher or lower. And I can't get into that on a Skype call. But... Um, 
just experiment with it and know that in my experience, almost every trumpet player who's having problems with articulation, dynamic range, playing low, playing soft, playing high, pretty much everything, it usually comes from an inefficient aperture. And most of you require downsizing. At least that was definitely true for me. Oh, great, great. Thanks for sharing your experience with that because yeah, that's that can be a tricky thing to know that's going on and then obviously how to fix it is a whole nother ball of wax. Um, I wanna go ahead, first of all, mentioned we're here live with Chris Still, so show us some love in the comments. Show us where you're viewing from. We had Ben Jaber check in from Fabulous horn player down in San Diego and Piper, uh, wonderful P Piper. Hey, Ben. Uh, Dave Leonig says hi. Uh, it's a lot of friends checking in. And Chase, I have to apologize. I skipped over your question. So let's get to Chase's question here. Uh, he says hi from Dallas. And he wants to know, uh, what are some things you do besides listening to get a, and keep a solid sound concept? Hmm. Uh, that's a, the question, the answer to that question is nothing. It's all about listening. It's literally entirely your concept of sound is what you're going to create. Um, you know, I, how to teach sound is a tough one. It's almost as complicated as teaching good rhythm and good time because it's such an internal thing. Um, I will say that listening to trumpet players is probably not the first place I would go for a sound concept. Uh, listening to vocalists who are a really good oboe player, especially for their connection and their sound connecting sound and the continuity of their lines. Man, that you can't beat a good singer or a good oboe player for that. But um, that's, yeah, it's just in my head is what I hear and that's what comes out of the bell on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer, Stan Martin checking in. Stan was just up here the other day. How you doing, buddy? Um, and oh, thanks, I, I pronounced uh, his name right, uh, Sanchiro. I'm good, I got it. <laughs> uh, one down. Um, so Chris, I wanna talk to you a little bit about uh, the program you're doing with Honesty Pill. Uh, uh, the, it's the online business accelerator, right? Now that sounds really exciting, especially considering what's going on in the world where a lot of us are, well, I'm back to work, but a lot of musicians don't have any place to play. Uh, so would you talk a little bit about what that is and the concept behind it and where you're going yeah. with it? So I don't have a crystal ball, um, but I will say that I kind of saw this, what's happening right now coming in that, and, and again, this, I, I don't know where the world's going right now with reopening businesses, if we're gonna have a, a second wave, of, I have no idea. But what I will say is, I knew that businesses were gonna start reopening and the world was gonna start going back to normal while musicians were still frozen in place, or in some cases, uh, continuing on the downward trajectory of lost work, canceled seasons, contracts disappearing, all that kind of thing. And that's kind of where we're at right now. You know, it, it, you would look around and you would think that we're heading back towards some sort of stability, and yet the New York Philharmonic just canceled this fall. That's not good. So what does that mean for musicians moving forward? Well, about three years ago when I started this, this coaching and practice company, Honesty Pill, um, I realized that, you know, we're capable of doing more than just showing up and being really good musicians or really good trumpet players or whatever you play in your orchestra or your band, or even being just a really good teacher at your college, that we're capable of a lot more based on all those skills that you've developed as somebody who has what it takes to spend 10,000 hours in a practice room, which is you know kind of the, the given number. So why would you tell a kid, you know, you should really learn an instrument because it does all these great things for you. You learn about organization and goal setting and time management, and community and working with others and all these great things that you can apply to just about any field. And then we become musicians who do one thing. We show up, we play our music, and we go home. So I felt like there's sort of a missing opportunity there to create something and serve a broader audience with those skills. And in fact, using that as an, in an online space would be a way to really broaden that reach. John, like, like we're doing right now, talking to people in all over the world. Um, I had no idea how critical this evolution was going to be that we'd have a pandemic that would literally be shutting down the in-person work that we all do and love so much and people uh, you know, depend on. So that is where this program, the Online Business Accelerator, uh, kind of came out of in helping people sort of figure out what is their superpower, what is their point of view, what do they stand for, what do they stand against. Is there an audience for what you have? And is this something that can be scalable? And if you can answer all those questions, 
then that's a really great idea. You might want to think about doing it. So my program just helps musicians figure out, do you have an answer to those questions? Maybe you don't. Maybe you do. My guess is you probably do, especially if you're a high-performing musician. You've probably figured out some pretty cool stuff along the way. Um, one other thing I can just mention about that to give you some hope if you're kind of stuck or you feel like, I mean, I've heard musicians say, I all I know is live performing. So what do I do? Well, you, you have to dig a little deeper. Uh, for example, a violinist I was talking to a few weeks ago was talking about um, her superpower was teaching jazz violin improvisation. And forgive me if I, if I mentioned this on the last call, but it's such a clear example of this. And so I said, wow, that's so cool. Like, you don't usually think of the violin as a jazz improv instrument. How, how fascinating for you. And then I said to her, well, what do you think the percentage of all violinists alive right now at any level, beginner to advanced, are clamoring for jazz improvisation content? And she said, oh, less than 1% maybe, which is probably accurate. So I said, let's just call it an even 1% and, you know, go from there. Hmm. Now, that's not that's to say that that superpower is not worthy of an online business because you can just reframe how you're positioning it and say something like, how many violinists, what percentage of violinists alive today would like to become more comfortable or confident or more expressive on stage in their performance and would consider using jazz improvisation as a, as a tool to develop that? Well, that just upped the number to a huge audience. Interesting. And then, of course, the next evolution would be, well, why are we limiting this to violinists? How many musicians alive today at any level, beginning through advanced, would like to become more expressive, more comfortable, more um, uh, productive on stage, and would consider using jazz improvisation as a tool to develop that. Well, now the audience is like 10 or 20x. So you have to kind of think about what your skills are and how you can serve somebody who needs that in a way that can be scaled up, put online, and in the end, generate income to the point where you can control what work you take, who, when are you working, who are you working with? What types of work are you doing? And frankly, uh, where in the world do you want to work from? And I think that this pandemic, if there's one thing that we're going to take away, is there's nothing that can that can completely replicate being in the room with somebody, especially for live performances. There's an energy in the room when you hear the LA Phil play. There's an energy in the room when you go to the Hollywood Bowl and hear uh, some major headliner with 18,000 other people. However, when that's not available to you, there's other parts of it that don't, it's not a zero sum game here. The, those things can exist online as well as in person. And if you're gonna be faced with a situation where your in-person work isn't possible for a particular reason, then it really makes sense to try and develop those other areas as well. And that's, that's kind of what my program does. It's a four month arc. Actually, it's starting July 6th, though. If anybody's listening who's interested and wants to hop on a free call, no strings attached. I'm just happy to talk about it. Um, I can share you the link to do that. Um, my calls are still being booked for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and I, I think down. we have the info and I think we have the link up at the descriptions above <laughs> um, and we'll throw it down in the comments as well. Um, and I should also, while we're talking about this, I mean, your, your Honesty Pill Facebook group is open and free and you provide so much content there. I don't know how you have the time to do it. It's amazing. Um, in fact, you just did a call uh, today with uh, Andrew Bain, right? About uh, the future of orchestras and things like that. That was fascinating. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, this this week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I've been doing a three-part series about how, how the pandemic has impacted three areas of our industry. Uh, music teachers was yesterday, orchestral musicians was this morning, and then tomorrow I'll be speaking with Angela Parrish, who's just incredible singer, songwriter, freelance musician, total incredible. Like she's the first sound you hear in the opening of La La Land. That's her singing. Um, so we're going to talk to her tomorrow. Hope you guys can join us. That's 9 a.m. Pacific on the Facebook page. But I mean, th the big takeaway here is just there. Th this this situation is not good, but. There's so many opportunities when they're the bigger the problem is, the bigger the opportunity is if that's the mindset you bring to it. And it's not always easy, but you know, it beats the alternative, you know? So I'm always trying to find how can I flip the script on this and make this work for me and work for the people around me and how can I lift up other people to do it?
which is obviously a huge topic the past few weeks as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, and like I, like I opened up with, I mean, that's it had an impact on me and what we do here at the shop. So that's it's great. You know, keep doing it. And for those of you watching, yeah, head over to the Honesty Pill Facebook group and get connected in there. It's a great community. And I don't always say that about Facebook groups, <laughs> as we all know. Um, well, one thing I, I definitely try and do in the Facebook group is um, – I have to say we've been batting a thousand. There hasn't been any disrespectful trolling, nothing weird. It's been a great environment. It's not trumpet players either. It's all sorts of musicians mm -hmm. and all sorts of levels. We've got professional players in there from different orchestras and, and high school, junior high kids. We've got YOLA students in there from Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles. So um, it's open to everyone who's interested in becoming a better musician, a better teacher, a better performer, and was willing to share and learn uh, from those around it, so it's it uh it's a little different than some of the vibe in in uh, some of the online forums now and then, um, but so far so good. <laughs> uh, let's get back. Well, we got uh, uh, Simon Sweeney's uh, checking in from Sydney, Australia. He's coming up on a future podcast episode, so awesome. uh, great to have uh, Simon watching. I uh, hope he's sipping some coffee down there. It's got to be pretty early, I think, down in uh, Australia. We have Christopher still here asking, uh, answering your questions live. So if you have any questions for Chris, throw them down in the comments. And if you're viewing, let us know where around the world you're viewing. Because uh, as I've mentioned before, it makes us feel connected. You know, you're sitting at home. I'm sitting here in the front room of the shop. And also, for those of you that are just joining us, this whole Q&A session will be archived both here on Facebook and also on YouTube. So if you have friends or students that don't have social media, they can watch it on YouTube. And also, if you missed stuff in the beginning, because we had a lot of great content already starting off, uh, you can rewind and watch the whole thing. So that's it for the business. Uh, let's get back to the questions. Now let's just get back to some trumpet playing. Uh, what are some of your favorite uh, pieces to play in the orchestra? Do you have one? If you had a desert island piece to play, uh, what would it be? I hate to be like super cliched, but it's Mahler 9, and it's the slow movement, which actually doesn't have very much trumpet in it at all. But, um, you know, Tom Stevens used to talk about um, audio equipment and the best speakers and the best setup and tube amps and everything like that. And he said, it doesn't matter because nothing in the world ever can compete with the sound I hear sitting inside of the orchestra. And if you, I, I hope for everyone listening that someday you get to sit in an orchestra uh, and listen to the last movement of Mahler's Ninth Symphony and hear, especially if you know that piece and, and the context of it about sort of the release of, of life and the end of your life and the acceptance that you're mortal and how the um, the sound just keeps dying away and it's just, it just gets softer and softer until you can barely hear it and then it comes back one more breath and it happens like six or seven times. And I, I'll have to say that playing that piece with the L.A. Phil in the Musikverein with Gustavo uh, a few years back was probably the best musical experience of my entire life. And so I suppose it would be Mahler 9 on the desert island, so. <laughs> But you know, but I don't know if that's cliche. Her, I mean, that's a good one. Herb Opera and the Tijuana Brass is a close second, though. So you know, let's not let's not leave that out. Depends on what they're serving on the island, I suppose, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, next question comes in from Instagram. I'm getting back to those uh, guys viewing. We have about another ten minutes here with Chris. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask Chris. Uh, throw them down in the comments and we'll ask them here live. The other one came in, uh, this is, came from Mike over on uh, Instagram and he wanted to thank you, Chris, for all you're doing on Honesty Pill. Um, and he was asking about nerves and stage fright and if you have any advice for uh, uh, performance anxiety, things like that. Yeah, that's a great question. It's such a big topic. Um, I'll try and condense it into a minute or two, but it, it's, it comes down to several things. First of all, it comes down to what is the difference between real danger and perceived danger, and does your subconscious mind know the difference? And the answer is there's a huge difference, and no, your mind doesn't know the difference. That's why um, haunted houses and horror films are so effective, because your your reaction to them on a physical level, a, chemist, like a biophysical level, is very authentic, as though it was really happening. So just being aware of the fact that you know a tiger is not going to jump out from behind a screen at an audition and pounce on you is, is the first step in demystifying and calming those nerves that nothing bad is going to happen. Another step in that direction would be to actually realize that the audience, or in the case of an audition, the panel, is not actually waiting for you to fail. 
and they're not hoping you will fail. They're, they're in fact hoping the opposite. They want to hear something beautiful in their audition. They're hoping that you're the one. You're they're hoping that you're going to play beautifully. And in fact, they love you so much already, they don't even care if you make a mistake or two. So that kind of can take the, the stakes down a little bit and make you realize nobody died. We're just playing music here. It's not, it's not life or death. So that's the first sort of thing I would say about um, the reaction to the perceived danger is all inside your head. The second thing is, it is a real thing, so how do we get comfortable with performance anxiety? And one of the ways you can do that is by um, repetition of simulation of those experiences. In other words, um, you know, I don't skydive, but I have friends that do, and I imagine that the first time was terrifying, second time was terrifying, third, fourth, fifth, I don't know how many times it took before it became, okay, I know how this goes, I know what happens here, I know the risk is you know, I guess you could call it minimal. Um, you get used to it. In fact, you can actually start to enjoy the process. So doing things like audition simulators for auditions is a great way to get used to those nerves so that you're not freaking out and your brain isn't racing. Um, if you're nervous about performing, perform. Do, do a concert every Friday. I know a trumpet player w went to school with did a recital every single Friday, every Friday. And I didn't go to all of them because it was a lot, but I mean, some of them were good, some of them were experimental, but he got so comfortable that by the time it came for his master's recital, it was like, oh, this old thing? I got this, I've done this a hundred times already. So um, that's a kind of a cool way to sort of approach it too, is just realize that there's no danger. Well, we're in this to communicate and connect with other people. And if you do still have a problem with nerves, you know, getting in there and, and, and facing those things over and over again until you realize how to manage those is a really good skill. Great advice. And, I, and that's what you told me about uh, doing the live stuff. Jump in, you know. Oh, yeah. Start doing yeah. it. <laughs> you know, and if, and if none of that works, experiment with beta blockers for auditions. Um, you know, I, I, I resisted that for a long time, but then I realized that everybody making the finals was to ha had different tools for getting there. And so, you know, I don't I don't really feel like that's a bad thing. I don't recommend using something like that for performance because I think it's a slippery slope. Um, more more work on the mindset part of it, I think, for, for nerves, and uh, you'll get there. Great advice. Okay, we have Vaughn from uh, Watsonville, California. Oh, my, my best friend's from Watsonville. So I hope you're doing up at Northern California up there. Uh, he has asking if you have any tips for recording practice sessions, which we're doing a lot of these days. Not funny, right? Yeah. I mean... That's another silver lining of pandemic is, especially like younger students, they are forced to record and watch themselves back almost daily now because uh, of the whole online lesson thing. I mean, I think we're gonna have a lot of people who are very good on camera coming out of this next generation because they've been doing Zoom calls with their teachers for the past 100 days. Um, I guess my advice on recording, and we can't get into equipment right now because it's too big of a topic, but record short, things and listen back right away while you still remember what they sound like. That's the best advice I can give because I have asked people to record their practice sessions and their extra practice and things and they come out with like an hour and a half recording on their phone which then they never actually listen to because who would? So just, you know, be really good at stopping and starting. Not to mention an added little bonus there is if you're recording and then listening right back, what are you also doing? you're also resting as much as you play and like actually mathematically, which is kind of something else that people forget to pace out their practice sessions so they don't get hurt. So I, I think just, you know, record short, listen back right away, pick a goal, work on it for 15 minutes. That's the best advice I can imagine for recording. Great advice. Yeah, and I'm like, even if just using your phone, I mean, whatever you have, right? You know, that that's like the question, what's the best camera to take a picture? Mm -hmm. The answer is it's the one that's in your hand. So, you know, obviously having a really nice microphone and a good space is great, and you should experiment with practicing in different types of acoustics. But um, the important thing is not to get bogged down in the tech, and then you never get around to it. Just, you know, use a voice memo on your phone if that's what you've got. My favorite app, actually, for practice recording is Tonal Energy, which is TE Tuner, Tonal Energy. And under the analysis uh, part of the app, there is a great feature called Stretch where you can stretch the speed down to a uh, half or even a quarter of the playback while maintaining the pitch. And you will hear some fascinating things in your playing Ooh. if you do that. 
Wow, <laughs> that sounds uh, that sounds good. <laughs> I, I suppose for jazz playing too, improvisation and transcribing, recording yourself and and being able to slow down and hear what you were actually playing would be would apply to that yeah. as well. I certainly never ever do that since I'm not a jazz player. I just appreciate jazz. But yeah, I guess for transcribing and stuff would yeah. be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, come on, Chris. You've been in pandemic. <laughs> You've been at home. You could. You're not going to come <laughs> out with a jazz jazz album. <laughs> We're going to have to be in lockdown for a heck of a long time for me to come out with a jazz record, especially in this town. <laughs> well, when it comes out, we'll have you back on, and we can. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next question comes from Dennis Johnson. Dennis has been. Uh, he's watched a few of these. Hey, Dennis, how you doing? Uh, he wants to know, uh, Chris who your early trumpet influences were well you know the honest answer is my dad uh who was actually a pharmacist but he was a amateur trumpet player in the north patchogue fire department band and he used to take me to those rehearsals and concerts down by the band shell and um he was my first musical memory of him in a downstairs uh study of our house playing uh Dark Town Strutter's Ball. I think I've mentioned that on the first podcast we did, John. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he, he was like the first sound of trumpet I had and got me involved in it because, you know, every kid's first hero is his dad, right? And I wanted to be like him. But then, um, you know, Philip Jones Brass Ensemble records are always playing in our house. And, of course, Herb Alpert, T. Wanna Brass. And um, in high school, I thought I was going to become the next Maynard Ferguson. And thank God I wised up real quick to that and <laughs> left that to Wayne Bergeron and friends. So, yeah, um... I was, I was like kind of a product of brass ensemble and jazz trumpet players, oddly enough, which is what I do. So <laughs> go figure. Yeah. Um, I mean, any uh, piece of advice that you remember from your teachers that particularly sticks out to you? You know, it's funny. My first trumpet teacher, Joel Sands, who was also my dad's first trumpet teacher, give you an idea of, of where he was at, um, used to write in my music in red pencil. And he wrote in my Hindemith Sonata, which, by the way, this guy had me learning the Hindemith Sonata when I was in, like, junior high school. It was so wow. cool. He wrote uh, three words in the upper left-hand margin of that music, which I still have in a box over here. And it said, breathe deep, relax. And I found that book after I was out of my master's degree and I was freelancing. And I was thinking about tension and breath use. And I found that Hindemith and I opened it up. And there it is, deep, breathe deep and relax. And I thought... That guy knew what he was talking about. It was really awesome. And I'm glad he wrote it in red pencil because it was still there all these years later. Breathe deep and relax. There you go. <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, we got time for one more question here. Uh, John is asking about reopening and what your thoughts are uh, with the orchestras. Obviously, it's not just, I mean, the press that having so many people like Disneyland reopening, things like that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, when you can um, reopen and when it'll yeah. be safe? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, but what I do know for 100% clarity is that orchestras and arts institutions that are willing to pivot and to reinvent and be really creative with how we reopen and, and even the types of music that we offer and the instrumentation and the venues, orchestras that are willing to reinvent and pivot will survive and the ones that cling to the old broken models will not. And that's, that's true for individual musicians as well. And that, that's actually kind of my mission right now is to help people realize that you have other options than what's right in front of you. And right now is a really good time to start exploring those options. Great advice. It's honor to have you on here, Chris. I mean, it's, oh. I always know what I can call you anytime and you're gonna have a wealth of information about all kinds of things, <laughs> trumpet well, and business and inspiration, so. Um, well, John, thanks. Thanks for having me on. And, and you know, thank you for making this resource available for all of us. Um, I know I'm going to go back. I still got some uh, interviews in your archive that I haven't gotten to yet. So that'll be my next stop. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, just real quick. Uh, what's the best way to, for folks to get a hold of you or find you? Website, Facebook, email? What's you can the best thing is join uh, Honesty Pill Facebook group, or you can always email me Chris at honestypill.com. Um, important thing to do would be to subscribe to my newsletter on my website because that's where all of my um, free training resources, announcements, and things happen. So that's honestypill.com. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Sounds good, Chris. It's been a pleasure. All right, John. All Thanks right. so much. Thank Take care. you. And thank you for watching. It's been. 
great 45 minutes here talking about trumpet and music business and inspiration. Next week on Monday, we will have trombonist Aubrey Logan. Uh, if you're familiar with the postmodern jukebox, she's on there. Singer, songwriter, wonderful trombonist, and she was recently featured on our Trombone Corner podcast. So if you haven't subscribed to that yet and you want to learn about our low br brass friends, go to tromboncorner.com. Also, we just posted an interview on the other side of the bell with Matthias Hoffs of the German Brass and, of course, a fabulous uh, solo recording artist. So that's available at uh, trumpetpodcast.com. And, of course, everything's on bobreeves.com. We try to be everywhere. Uh, so be sure to follow us, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And as I mentioned before, this whole Q&A with Chris Still will be archived here on Facebook and then also on YouTube. So we hope you'll share it. Thank you guys for watching. Be safe, be healthy, and go out and practice some, shall we? Bye-bye.